Okay, right, so now I'll, I'll just, we've got only about 15 minutes before the break, but I'll just briefly say, um, continue with what we were doing last time. Okay? So what we were doing last time is trying to come up with a relativistic definition of momentum. So we saw that Newtonian momentum is not compatible with the principle of relativity, in the sense that if one observer thinks that Newtonian momentum is conserved, then another another observer with a different velocity will measure that Newtonian momentum is not conserved. So the two observers disagree about conservation of Newtonian momentum. So that's a bad thing. And we were trying to look for a new definition of momentum such that all observers can agree at the same time. So we want a new definition of momentum such that all observers agree momentum is conserved. <coughs> Sorry. Now, last time I told you how, how we're going to do it, um, and I used an analogy, so I just want to briefly remind you of that again. So, last time we looked at rotations in two dimensions. So, rather than considering observers with different velocities, we consider observers with different coordinate axes. So this one is S, he has coordinates X and Y. S prime has coordinates X prime and Y prime. And they are related by a rotation of angle theta. Okay? Then we saw in this system you can define the rotation matrix R theta, which was cos theta sine theta minus sine theta cos theta. <coughs> and we saw that using this rotation matrix, we could write the transformation of coordinates in the form, so these are two vectors. A two vector is some quantity, a two component quantity, such that the quantity measured by this observer is equal to the rotation matrix times the quantity measured by this observer. Right. So x is coordinates measured by him, x prime is coordinates measured by him. Okay. And any quantity which satisfies this kind of equation is known as a two vector. Okay. Then I showed that velocity, because of this, is also a two vector. Okay. Why is velocity a two vector? Because the velocity measured by S prime is defined as dx prime by dt prime. Okay? But in this example, they measure the same time. Right? They measure the same time. So this is just d by dt. And from there, x prime is just r theta x. Now, because these are linear transformations, you can swap the order. So this is r theta times d by dt x. <coughs> but this is r theta times the velocity measured by the s-observer. So you see that velocity is also a two-vector. It also satisfies an equation like this. <coughs> So that was the analogy. Now let me do the real thing. So instead of rotations in 4D, we now look at Lorentz transformation. In four dimensions. The four dimensions being time plus three of space. So now, again, we have the two observers, S and S prime. And now the S prime observer is moving relative to the S observer. 
the speed u. Okay, and the S observer measures coordinates t, x, y, z. And the S prime observer measures coordinates t prime, x prime, y prime, z prime. Okay. So again, we can define the coordinate transformation between the two. And again, it takes the form of a matrix, which we can call the Lorentz matrix. <coughs> L of u. So I'm going to write it in a slightly different form from before, okay. So before that, you've got these four vectors, x. So the position four vector is a combination of time with space x, y, and z. Okay. I think last time I put time at the bottom, but I'm going to put time at the top, which is the convention. Okay. So the convention is that time goes first, usually. And also time, to make the units the same, we multiply it by the speed of light. Okay? So then all four coordinates have the units of distance. So with these four vectors, the Lorentz matrix takes the form gamma minus gamma u over c minus gamma u over c gamma 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. 1, 0, 0, 1. Okay? And with this matrix and this definition of four <coughs> vectors, you have the coordinate transformation that the coordinates measured in the S prime frame are equal to the Lorentz matrix times the coordinates measured in the S frame. So it's very easy just to multiply out this equation, this times this, and check that that corresponds to our usual definition of Lorentz transformation. <coughs> now the problem, the next thing is to define the four, ve four vector velocity. The problem is that we can't simply define it as dx prime by dt prime because they have different definitions of time, right? If I try to do something similar to what I did here, in the case of two vectors, you see it doesn't work. Because dx prime by dp prime, this is d by dt prime of L of u times x. And again, you can swap the order. So this is L of u times dx by dt prime. But this is not the same is L of u times dx by dt, right? Because they have different measurements of time. Okay, so therefore, this quantity is not a four vector. It does not satisfy that the quantity measured in S prime is equal to the matrix times the quantity measured in S. It doesn't work. So therefore, the quantity dx by dt is not a four vector. And that's what we need to correct. Okay? We need to find a four vector velocity and then, from that, we can find a four-vector momentum. And I showed last time, once you know it's a four-vector, the conservation law is automatically true in every reference frame, okay, which I'll show you again. <coughs> so you see the idea, the problem here, why is this not a four-vector? It's because the two observers have different measurements of time. Right? If they use the same measurement of time, then this would work. And that's the solution. So the solution is that simple. You need to find a measurement of time on which the two observers agree. Right? And then you get a four vector. <coughs> so okay. yeah, let me write here. Okay. Solution is find a measurement of time. <coughs> 
on which both observers can agree. So how can we do that? Well, we're talking about velocity. So these observers must be measuring the velocity of something, right, a particle or whatever. So we can imagine the situation as follows. You've got here the S observer, and you've got here the S prime observer, who is moving as usual. And they're measuring the speed of something like a particle here, which has a certain free vector velocity v, which is vx, vy, vz. So note, in my notation, I make a difference between this and this, right? This means the normal three-dimensional velocity that we're used to, okay? And this with a double arrow means the four vector velocity, which is the thing that we want to find, okay? So in my notation, these things are different quantities. Okay, that's also fairly standard notation. Right, so they need to find a measurement of time they can agree on. So this observer has a clock which measures time t. This observer has a clock which measures time t prime. But those are not good, right? They're useless because they don't agree with each other. Okay? And the only other thing you've got in, in this problem, apart from these two observers, is the particle itself. Okay? So the only solution you can give is to say that both observers, instead of using the clocks that they have, should use a clock as carried by the particle. So you can imagine that the particle in this problem is also carrying a clock. Okay? And the clock carried by a particle measures some amount of time, which we can call S. And if both observers agree to use the particle's measurement of time rather than their measurements of time, then we can define a velocity four vector. Okay? They use the same measurements of time, so therefore, in this equation here, you don't have this problem between the measurements of time. Okay, so let me write that. Okay, so both observers agree to use time as measured by the particle in the calculation of four vector velocity or in the definition in the calculation. <coughs> so that's, this is the point, point, point is that they, they don't use their own measurements of time, they use the measurement of time such that a clock carried by the particle would measure. So then what is this? Well, we can work this out because we know that there's the time dilation effect. So this tells you that the time as measured by the clock, which I can call ds, so this is a small unit of time measured by the clock, is equal to the time measured by the observer dt multiplied by the time dilation factor, which is the square root of 1 minus phi squared over c squared. That's from the perspective of S, and from the perspective of S prime, this is dt prime times the square root of 1 minus v prime squared over c squared, where v prime is the speed as measured by the S prime observer. Okay, so therefore we define four vector velocity. as v with a double arrow which is the derivative of the four vector position 
with respect to the particle's time. Okay? And then from this definition here, this is equal to 1 over the square root 1 minus v squared over c squared times dx by dt. So the difference between the four vector definition of velocity and the normal definition of velocity is in this factor here. And the meaning of this factor is that the time used in the measurement is not the time measured by the observer, but it's the time as measured by the particle. Okay. So with that definition, you can, I mean, I've done it already, but you can quickly check again that this thing really is a four vector. Okay. What does that mean? It means in the S prime frame, that's defined as dx prime by ds, but now it's the same s on the bottom. So this is d by ds of L of u of x, which is L of u of dx by ds, which is L of u of v. So therefore, this quantity satisfies the four-vector equation. It transforms in the right way. <clears throat> now, once you've got that definition, you can immediately define the four vector momentum simply by multiplying by the mass of the particle. <coughs> so we define the four vector momentum <coughs> as P, again with two arrows, which is M times the four vector velocity, which is M over the square root one minus b squared over c squared times d by dt of, okay, let me do it, so it's at dx by dt, which is m over square root 1 minus b squared over c squared, d by dt of c t x y z. <coughs> That's the four vector position, right? So this is m over square root 1 minus b squared over c squared. So here I just get c, and here I get the velocity vx, vy, vz. So that's the four vector momentum. Okay? And it is a four vector because we've proved that v is a four vector and the mass is a scalar. That means the mass measured by both observers is the same. Right? So that doesn't change. Okay? And once you know it's a four vector, you automatically know that if one observer thinks it's conserved, then any other observer will think it's conserved too. Okay? And the proof for that, I wrote out for the case of two vectors last time, but let me just write it up again. So this is, this is the crucial point, this is what we wanted, the law of conservation of this four vector quantity, P, is independent of the observer. Velocity. <laughs> okay. so Either both observers measure it is conserved, or both observers measure it's not conserved, but they must agree. Okay. And the way you prove that is as follows. So in S, conservation law looks something like this. At a certain point in time, you add up the momentum of all the different particles or whatever in your system, and that should be equal to the total momentum 
at a later time t2. Right? So I can write a general conservation law like this. Right? Total momentum at time t1 is total momentum at time t2. Now I can multiply both sides of this equation by the Lorentz matrix. Right? This is a four vector, so I can multiply by a four by four matrix. So that gives me L of u times sum upon i t i t1 equals L of u i t i t2. Now, if you use the fact that this is a linear transformation, that means you can swap the sum with the matrix. So that means you can write this as the sum upon i of L of u times pi t. And this is the sum upon i t1 times L of u pi t2. Okay. And then because this thing is a four vector, this is just momentum measured in S prime. Right? So this means that the sum upon i of pi prime t1 is equal to the sum upon i pi prime t2. But what does this mean? This means you've also got conservation same conservation law in S prime. So that's the proof. It's a very nice, easy proof. If it's conserved in S, it must also be conserved in S prime. Okay, and that's what we want. Okay, so that's a good point to take a break. So we'll stop for 10 minutes. So using this idea of four vectors, it's a very powerful idea. Okay, as you can see that we got the answer without too much work. Okay? We've been able to prove that if we define momentum as being this quantity, then conservation of this quantity will be agreed upon by all observers. Okay? Which is not the case for the Newtonian definition of momentum. So we'll stop there. After the break, then we'll discuss some of the consequences of this definition.